Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and uh, a very special welcome to you all during this uh, centenary year, and uh, one of the finest uh, alumni reunions I think that we've ever had. We've got over 850 alumni and partners registered, so we've never had anything like that before, but as I say, this is a very special year, so uh, a great welcome to all of you. And we've got people, I mean most of you are, are scientists and engineers, uh, the history of the college, but we've, we've got people from uh, uh, medicine, we've got people from agriculture, who as you know, uh, came later into the college. We've got people who graduated in 2006, and I think we've got one person who graduated uh, in 1937. <laughs> That is Mr. Robert Whitby. Is Mr. Whitby here? No, he's still in bed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's quite remarkable that he's registered to come. And uh, I'm sure he'll be here when the real action starts. <laughs> it's quite interesting, isn't it, that old habits die hard. When you were here before, you never sit in the front row and you're still not sitting in the front row. <laughs> But there are a lot of events uh, organised today and tomorrow, so I hope you all participate in those. There's been a lot of hard work gone into it from the Alumni Development Office, from Fiona and her team. So I hope uh, there's something for everybody. And please wander around, look at the place, it's changed a lot, uh, and uh, get a good feel for it. Before I introduce uh, uh, Tidu, who will introduce David King, or Sir David King, who's going to be our guest to speaker this morning, I just want to give you a, a feel for the college today. Some of you uh, I know probably up to speed, some of you less so, so I, I just want to spend a little time uh, doing that. So if we, if we start then, uh, first of all, welcome back. Uh, it's great to see you all, uh, and it's, uh, we, we've got lots of uh, records, I'm sure, uh, of all of you in the archives, and, and you see some of them there. Uh, the history, you all know the history, uh, but of course the constituent colleges really were, were driven by Prince Albert anywhere from, uh, I, I think, uh, before 1851, 1846, the, the Royal College of Chemistry, uh, but then the, <coughs> the Royal College of Science was formed, uh, the City and Guilds, uh, the Royal School of Mines, but it's quite interesting, at the beginning of the 20th century, there's a great debate in London uh, about having a Charlottenburg. Interestingly enough, at that time, Charlottenburg was the centre uh, of engineering and technology. So we wanted to emulate Charlottenburg. And, and so the, the great men at the time decided that, well, we already had it. You have it in South Kensington with these constituent colleges. If you put the constituent colleges together, then you will have a Charlottenburg. And that's really what drove the, the bringing together of the three constituent colleges which had already been brought to the South Kensington site. And of course it was called Imperial College because it was on the site of the old Imperial Institute, uh, which you can see here. And, and the only vestige that's left of the old Imperial Institute is the Queen's Tower. So they were formed, uh, started, and then nothing really uh, increased the size of the college except to organic growth till we got to uh, this period of 88 to 2000 when it was recognised that, that medicine was becoming a very scientific subject. Medicine was no longer the social subject that it had been. It needed to be close to science. So they took the medical schools out of the hospitals and put them into the universities. I think that was a very smart move. I think it was a smart move for medicine, but I think it was a smart move for science as well. It's changed dramatically, and I'll give you just a feel for that this morning. But so, so during that period uh, of the 90s, 
where these, these medical schools integrated in, into Imperial College uh, and made it quite a different place. Then in 2000, the merger uh, with Wild College. Uh, and then in this centenary year, because as you know, originally Imperial College was not a part of the University of London. The, the founding fathers had resisted that. They said, no, 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 no we don't want to be part of that lot. Uh, <laughs> and quite rightly so, I guess. Uh, and, until it became a bureaucratic nightmare for all sorts of reasons that some of you may remember. And, and so in the 30s they joined the University of London. Uh, but to us now it became uh, uh, just a, a burden, if you like. So it, it was time during our centenary year to leave the University of London and become an independent institution in our right. Uh, and, and I think that was exactly the, the right thing to do. Uh, <clears throat> i just read you a quote here. It's been a century of great achievement, and my thanks go to all the people, the staff, and the students whose work over the decades has enabled Prince Albert's vision to flourish. Those were the words of the Queen when she came on July the 7th, uh, or 9th, uh, to, uh, to actually give us our independence from the University of London and open the Institute uh, for Biomedical Engineering. As you know, the Royal Family have always had a close association with Imperial through Prince Albert, uh, and uh, that's the third time that the Queen's been here in almost uh, as many years. So today, uh, Imperial is a very different place. If you look at these uh, leak tables, which people take a lot of notice of today, you know, in every <laughs> walk of life, we've got leak tables today. Uh, here you see them in education. But whatever you think about them, they are important. People take notice of them for technology. Uh, Imperial is first in Europe, what you, is what you'd expect and has been uh, for a long time, fourth in the world, in biomedicine, it's doing extremely well for science, uh, and overall in the world, the ninth uh, best university in the world, compared in, in, in a comparison done by the higher education uh, supplement. First in Europe for entrepreneurship, so the business school has flourished over the years, it's developed, it has a specialization in entrepreneurship, which is critically important when you're running an institution that's about science and technology and medicine. You want to develop a spirit of entrepreneurialism, so you're wanting to take your work and develop it and bring it to the marketplace. So uh, that's critically important as well. Our estate uh, has grown dramatically uh, from the time that many of you were here. There are now six London campuses, of course, many of them hospitals, uh, and. Uh, you see them there, uh, Silwood Park, which many of you will remember at Ascot, and then why the agricultural estate came to Imperial uh, in, in 2000. Recent campus developments, well, there have been a lot. A lot of things have changed. Uh, there was a period up until uh, about 1997 when very little money flowed into the universities in this country. Uh, Margaret Thatcher had, had really pulled back on that. The Conservative government had been uh, very mean in, in putting money into higher education. When the Labour government came in 1997, at least they recognised that, so they put a lot more money into infrastructure. That helped us, and we helped ourselves, of course. So we've got the new Tanaka Business School now and the college entrance, which the Queen opened in 2004. Uh, and I'm sure if it, it, many of you have come through there this morning, but if you haven't, go in there because that's quite dramatic. Uh, we've got the new administrative building which was designed by Fosters uh, and that's in the uh, uh, Dolby Court uh, which uh, you won't recognise today. It's changed uh, significantly. We've got a, a sports centre in Princess Gardens which is probably one of the best sports centre of any university in the UK. Again, please go and see that if you haven't seen it. Redevelopments of the Central Library, because libraries are changing, as you can imagine, today uh, with all the technology. The Union Building in the back quad is being redeveloped because students, uh, uh, they don't want to live in slums anymore, they want to live in nice accommodation, <laughs> everything else. Uh, the Bessemer Building, the old Bessemer Building has been completely refurbished, £20 million refurbishment uh, to create the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, the incubators. Uh, the Bionana Technology Suite, uh, redevelopment of buildings on the Hammersmith and Mary's campuses. So we are spending today about £150 million a year on infrastructure. That is a lot of money. Even for a business, that's a lot of money. 
Our students we have today from the 600 students that started here in, in 1907, uh, we have uh, 13,000 students. And that's probably a cap. That's just about as many as we can take. We've got to be careful that we don't swamp this campus and the other campuses because that would be not good for us, wouldn't be good for the students. 8,300 undergraduates uh, and about 4,700 postgraduates. So you've got about two-thirds undergraduates, one-third postgraduates. And that balance is probably about right. You see all the, uh, the courses there. And of course, this is still uh, a, a top university in, in terms of student choice. So we get a lot of applications for every single place, as you can imagine. Uh, and most of the time now, we don't accept anybody without three A's at A level for, for all the obvious reasons. The students uh, <coughs> come, as they always have, from very diverse areas around the world. Even when you were here, it was a, an international university. It's probably more so today. Students from 123 countries and outside the UK the number one country that sends more students to this university than any other is mainland China. That has changed even in my time. When I arrived here in 2001, there were 60 mainland Chinese in this university. Today there are 1,700. <laughs> because they want to do technology, they want to do hard science, they recognize that that's the future of their economy. Whereas we've decided that, that media studies are the future of our economy. <laughs> so we're not interested in that science. So that, that, that's what changes it. It's amazing. But you see, 32% of our staff are, are non-UK nationals as well. Uh, and 34% uh, of the alumni now live overseas. So it's a very, very diverse institution. Uh, I think coming to Imperial is good for you. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, but also good for you when you go out to work, uh, because in a, a survey last week, we're now the second highest graduate starting salary in the UK, uh, and you can see that. And a lot of our students today, of course, because of physics, because of engineering, because of mathematics, because of chemistry, they're analytically trained. The city want these guys, they want these people, because they want them driving these algorithms to drive all these fancy mathematical formulas uh, for making money. You see what's happened to the city now. <laughs> <laughs> Our alumni, just talking about alumni, we have 140,000 former students uh, on the database. And there are probably 120,000 of those alive today. So those are the people that, that, that have graduated probably since 1907. So you can see the, the, the breakdown there. So we, we're making a big effort now to get an alumni database, to get everybody registered, uh, to uh, get in touch with everybody, to keep communicating. But last week I was uh, uh, in Madagascar with Rio Tinto, the mining company, of course, who employs a lot of people who came out of the, the Royal School of Mines. I met a guy in Madagascar, turns out he'd been at the Royal School of Mines, but he hadn't heard about any imperial for 25 years. So he's not on the database, I can assure you. Uh, so there must be a lot of people we're, we're still missing somewhere, but we're, we're, we're trying hard. Of course, a lot of famous people have come out of Imperial, and, uh, and that's important. We've had CEOs, we've had chairmen, we've had uh, all sorts of people around the world. Trevor Phillips, of course, chair of the Commission of Racial Equality, who did chemistry here, some of you will remember him. Roger Parrister, who was the breaker of the Four Minute Mile, was at Mary's. Uh, and uh, Brian May, uh, the lead guitarist of rock, came here to do astrophysics, <laughs> if you remember. But then he, he recognised that playing a guitar would be much more lucrative, so he set, shot off. 37 years later, he's come back, finished his PhD, and now got his PhD in astrophysics. So he will be coming back to the, to the commemoration ceremony in spring to receive his PhD. So that would be interesting. Benefits for alumni? Well, of course, there are lots of them now. Uh, Fiona and her team have put lots and lots of things in place. Uh, we've, got, we've got lots of events. We're trying to, to, to get communications out to you all the time. There's a website that you can get into. There are lots of benefits that you can uh, get involved in. So I would encourage you to do that. And of course, all the, a lot of the lectures now, the main lectures, like the Schrodinger lecture, uh, 
uh, the Gabor lecture. All the major lectures are put onto a web stream, so you can get them on your iPod, you can get them downloaded. And I would uh, uh, really recommend that sometime, if you're on an aeroplane, you listen to some of these, because the technology now is, is brilliant in that respect. Alumni giving back. Uh, I mean, uh, there's been a tremendous response now from alumni around the world to, to recognise they were here, they benefited from being here, uh, and they want to give something back. And that could be quite small, but it, I, I think it's just the, 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 the involvement that's important. So we've got the Students' Opportunity Fund that has done extremely well. Uh, in, you know, money coming in, 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 in £50, pounds, £100, pounds, £200, pounds, people making those commitments. And that helps students from around the world who are, who are financially cannot afford to come to Imperial College. They're very smart, they're very bright, but financially they find it difficult. So we then, using this fund, can help them. We pay for their tuition, pay for their accommodation, and then we can get some very bright kids who would not have come here otherwise by using that fund. Library redevelopment has benefited from the fund. The Union Building Redevelopment at Byte has also developed, a, developed from that fund. Uh, got lots of volunteers around the world, and that's very good because you're all ambassadors of Imperial College. It's been very important, I have to tell you, overseas, because when you talk about Imperial College, when you give people advice, then they say, I want to go to Imperial College. And that's good for us because we then get a catchment area of some of the brightest people in the world. That's what we want to attract here. That's critically important. If we're going to run a, a residential university, then the students must be bright because the, the scientists, the, the lecturers, the professors, they want to be stimulated all the time. They just don't want to teach uh, people who have no interest. They want to teach people where they're getting feedback. So the, the brighter the, the student, the better the, the entire organisation. So uh, thank you very much, all of you, for, for participating, however you have, in, in one of those areas. Just talking about our staff, uh, today we have 8,200 staff, uh, 3,000 academic and research staff, and remember that most of the staff, the, the research staff at Imperial, are research active. You know that, you come here, you don't just come here to while your time away, you come here and you work hard. And, and so most people uh, not only teach, but are, are very research active. The 3,000 support staff, this is a big operation, the turnover of Imperial College today is over £600 million a year. That's a big operation. So it needs to be run professionally. And then you can see uh, the rest of it. And in terms of the, the research staff, 75% of the academic staff submitted in the last research assessment exercise in 2001 were, five, were in five-star departments. That was, along with Cambridge, that was the highest uh, in the UK. Now the RE is coming up again. Uh, this year, uh, and again, obviously, it's very important to do well in the RE because that determines our funding going forward for the future. Past achievements, uh, 14 Nobel laureates have, have come out of being associated with the Imperial College. You'll recognise some of these. Uh, Alexander Fleming, uh, Uxley, uh, <coughs> and uh, Porter, uh, all in, in the, the clinical biological area. Gabor and, and Abdeslam from physics. Geoffrey Wilkinson from chemistry, but of course, you know, there were, there were five other Nobel Prize winners from chemistry. There was a time here in the 60s when you had uh, two Nobel Prize winning uh, chemists, you had a prize winning uh, biochemist chain in the, in the biochemistry building, and uh, you had uh, Dennis Gabor. And that's amazing that there were four Nobel Prize winners on this side at one time. I must have a hell of a problem, but it, it, would be <laughs> it would be a nice problem to have. Uh, and that's changed because of, of all the, the environment's changed, everything's changed. But uh, I think Imperial's done extremely well. Of course, we've got a lot of science stars of the past. Uh, George Finch, who, who was involved in developing breathing apparatus for high altitudes. Henry Tizard, that many of you will uh, remember, of course, worked uh, during the war with the radar. Eric Claythwaite, who, of course, many of you will probably remember Eric and his, his, his apparatus and, and showing this thing running along this path and this idea he had and people thought he was mad and eventually went mad. But, uh, <laughs> but in today in Shanghai, there it is, wonderful. You get on the, the, the maglev train in Pudong and you're at the airport in seven minutes. I mean, it's unbelievable, 400 kilometres uh, uh, an hour. And that's the, the maglev train that basically Eric Claythwaite worked on. 
David Potter was here in physics, and of course he's the guy who basically set up uh, Sion, and he's been very good to us. He, he supported the Maths Institute very significantly. And then William Ham Hamilton and his genetic gene-centric view uh, on evolution. But today, we've still got those stars. Obviously, they're coming through the whole time. John Berland, he'll talk to you this afternoon about the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He was critically important uh, in, in that, and as you know, at Imperial Soil Mechanics, has probably been one of the, the, the strongest departments in the world, Soil Mechanics, and, and John Berland is one of those people. Maggie Yacoub, uh, who pioneered heart and lung transplantation, very famous, and, and, and many others, and, and uh, Tiny Maney, who, who's uh, Tidu's brother, uh, is, uh, it, along with Mark Feldman, uh, won the Lasker Prize uh, a couple of years ago. Lots of recent achievements. Uh, you're going to hear today again, uh, those interested from John Pendry uh, in the top left-hand corner, and, and Aradazi in, in the bottom right. Aradazi, a famous surgeon, a famous robotic surgeon, uh, but the poor fellow has now become a Minister of Health. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he might say a few words about that to you. Uh, this is a, a green racing car uh, developed by the students in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and that's a hybrid, so it's, uh, it's carbon neutral, uh, fascinating system. But, of course, lots of things go on all the time. Recent research. Of course, the research at Imperial is still groundbreaking. That's what you'd expect. It's still current. It's dealing with work problems. Uh, just the top one there uh, is a project to develop an all-in-one cooker, energy generator, and fridge. And that is to, to improve the quality of life of people in developing countries. An enormous amount of work going on here in infectious diseases, malaria, probably the largest concentration of researchers working on malaria in the world now at Imperial. So, it's changed quite significantly. And then the bottom one uh, is, is the, what you see there is the compact muon solenoid. It's not compact at all. Uh, it, it, it's a 12,500 ton digital camera uh, that is sat in 100 meters in the CERN tunnel that is part of the Hadron Collider. They're going to turn this fella on next year to try and find, one of the things they're going to try and find is the Higgs boson uh, to try and understand <coughs> where the matter is in the universe. But this is being led by Jim Verdi out of physics at Imperial College. This is part of the biggest experiment in the world. I mean, absolutely fascinating. And that thing there, as I say, is absolutely enormous. So you can see somebody standing. You can just see them as a speck. Being put together with the, with the meticulous work of putting a watch together. Uh, and this program's been going on for 25 years. But that's absolutely fascinating. Interdisciplinary working. What, you, as a university, we developed it in departments, as you know, uh, and then we had these, these institutions. But what we've had to try and do is bring people to work together. It's critically important today that physicists and chemists and engineers and biologists and clinicians work side by side. You're not going to solve any of the world's major problems by working in silos. You've got to use your, your knowledge, you've got to use your skills together. And so, in, in, what we've tried to do here is create different institutes, different combinations. The Energy Futures Lab brings people all over Imperial who are working on energy. The Grantham Institute for Climate Change, everybody who's working in that sort of area can now be part of that. The Institute for Systems Biology, people from all over the, the, the campuses are part of that institute. The Institute for Biomedical Engineering, the same thing, electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, clinicians, mathematicians, you name it, they're all working together. Critically important today uh, if we're going to get on top of some of the big problems. An enterprise culture, I said that before, it's always been true. Imperial was the vision of Prince Albert who wanted a university in the UK where you didn't have to sign up to the 39 articles of the Anglican faith before you went there. So he said, let's have a university where you can actually do something useful and work with industry and commerce. So that's always been true of Imperial. That enterprise culture still exists. 58 spin-out companies, 90 commercial agreements, etc., etc., etc. Innovations is now floated on the stock exchange. Uh, <coughs> and so that's a company uh, floated on the exchange that Imperial uh, have the major shareholder of. 
the market value of that is 150 million, and that's raised a lot of money for, for Imperial. So that's critically important again, so that we become more and more financially independent uh, from the government. And then finally, uh, our links with business. We received the Supporter uh, British Industry Award, uh, the best, uh, in 2006. And that's very, very important, I think, for a university like Imperial that does see itself as a very practical, pragmatic institution. Uh, and you, I, you've all been involved in that. You've all seen that, I'm quite sure. You came here to get an education that, that would put you in a good position to go out there and, and change the world, to do something useful. And I think that <laughs> is critically important. And that's what we've done. And you've got a, a statement here uh, from Professor David King himself, who is uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor. So, that I think is, is, is a sort of good overview of Imperial College today. It's a great institution, we're part of the entire value chain, we do basic fundamental research, don't forget that, critically important. We've got some of the brightest minds in the world doing that, but we can take that information all the way through the system, all the way through to the market. So we're not just concentrated on translational research, we're not just interested in the marketplace, but we're interested in breaking the boundaries of science at the same time. Critically important for an institution like Imperial. And in my opinion, this place will go from strength to strength. And it's from people like you who built the foundations on which we can develop this for the future. So thank you very much, thank you for being here, uh, and I hope you have a fantastic time, and I'm sure I'll see some of you around for the rest of the day. Thank you. I'm now going to introduce Dr. Tidu Maini, who, who was also uh, an alumnus of Imperial. He studied uh, engineering here in the Royal School of Mines. Uh, I managed to persuade him to come back here in 2002 uh, to be one of my team, uh, and he's been a great supporter. So, Tidu. Thank you, Richard, and uh, once again, a very warm welcome. It's lovely to see all of you here. It's, you're right, actually, Richard. We never sat in the front row. <laughs> With one exception, we had uh, a lecturer in mechanical engineering, Professor Grutenhaus. He was so short-sighted, he couldn't even see us in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only time we sat in the front row I remember very well. So I have great pleasure in introducing our next speaker, Sir David King, who you all know is the chief scientist to the Prime Minister. Now, there are not many people in this world who will get up at 4 o'clock in Tuscany to come and speak to you. And really, this is fabulous that, David, you could get up so early in the morning, give up the pleasures of the, the Tuscan countryside, and come and speak to us. Uh, we really, really appreciate it. David is a uh, fellow African who grew up, was born in South Africa, grew up in, uh, in, Af in, in, in South Africa, went to school there, and had a glittering career at Wits University, where he did very well, and then decided, because the conditions were not right in South Africa. He disagreed totally with what was happening. He left South Africa to come to England, and he chose Imperial College. So he came here uh, to the Department of Chemistry, had a great uh, career at, in, at Imperial, until one day uh, when he blew up the chemistry lab. <laughs> uh, I think things were never the same for David uh, uh, after he blew up the lab. And since then, his relationship with Imperial has been very turbulent. <laughs> and even as the chief scientist, he's given us such a hard time. And every time we go for grants, we have to work twice as hard as Cambridge. <laughs> David decided it was time to go to Cambridge from Imperial, where life was easier. Uh, <laughs> he went to his bicycle, uh, and he became head of chemistry, master of dining college, and of course did very well in Cambridge, and was spotted by uh, Tony Blair, who made him his chief scientist in 2000. 2000. And ever since then, poor David has had huge problems to contend with. Uh, he had the mad cow disease, uh, and he's, he thought he had solved it, and he came back with a vengeance this year. So really, he's, he's been at the forefront of major, major issues we've had to face. Uh, it was his leadership uh, that, that helped us to contain this awful disease, and you'll hear a lot about it this afternoon from Neil Ferguson. Uh, in, in, in terms of how dangerous these issues are. 
If that wasn't enough, he had bird flu next on his hands, an avian flu. He managed that as well. And, and when he thought that was about over, he had uh, the, the terrorist issues. Uh, and he'd had to contend with a variety of disciplines, everything from basic science and biology to engineering to explosives. And really, it's a testament to his, his intellect and his dedication. So really, we're delighted you could come. And his passion for the last few years has been climate change. David has really put a lot into this, uh, both from his scientific background and his ability to communicate and, and, and really get to the heart of the issues. He's been dealing with various heads of state and has, and has been the champion for climate change. And because of him, there have been major, major changes. And he was instrumental in the, the Stern Report in, in getting that to the public and making sure it happened. And really, we have a lot to thank him for, and future generations will thank him for his huge contributions. So ladies and gentlemen, Sir David King. <laughs> I'm still going to say a very warm congratulations for your 100th, uh, 100th anniversary. I do think this college has uh, made a, a tremendous impact, uh, not only on the development of this nation, but as we've seen through the international impact, uh, a, a worldwide uh, impact. Now, of course, my theme is really going to be the 21st century. So we have been discussing all the achievements of the, of the last hundred years. But as we move into the next century, I'm going to suggest all of those achievements now need to be re-geared as we move into the 21st century. We will depend heavily on what science, engineering, medicine, and technology can deliver, but the demands are very different. So when we entered the 20th century, when Imperial College began as this uh, joining up of, college, of, of the constituent colleges. Life expectancy around the planet was around 45. Um, I would say largely as a result of the advances in science, engineering, medicine, technology, but I have to also deliver some accolades to the economists and the social scientists and institutional structures. Our life expectancy at the end of the century globally it is to about 75. For this country, it's close on 80 now. And that's a massive tribute to what, uh, to what we've been delivering for our societies around the world. That's been exported around the world. There's a downside to that, and the downside is that because our life expectancy goes up, it means many more young people survived into maturity than in the past. That's not a downside. But they then wanted to have children, and so it meant that population grew. Right? So it was a direct follow-through from the better well-being that we established, the population would explode. So we entered the 20th century with one and a half billion people. And because of all our successes, I'm going to say, we entered the 21st just over six billion. So we started adding another billion every 12 years. Now, as we enter this 21st century, here we are at six and a half, we have a, a demographic schism. So I've just come back from Italy, uh, where I was talking about the same topic last night. Um, in Italy, the population is, is decreasing in size. The female fertility rate, which should be 2.1 for a country at level population, but the female fertility rate in Italy is rapidly approaching one. Right, so we have a, a real situation where some countries are still in the population explosion phase and others are already diminishing. Interesting piece of social science that underlies that. It seems whatever the country's policy, for example, China, one child family, or other countries such as Malaysia, <coughs> female fertility rates go down as well-being goes up. And critically there, is female education, female empowerment. Women tend historically to have two children who will survive into maturity. And in the Middle Ages, that meant you had seven or eight, and now it means you have about two. Except if you're in Italy, I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> right, so 
Now as we move through this century, what's that going to, how's that trend going to develop? By 2028, I'm going to say we will pass 8 billion. By mid-century, we'll be plateauing out at about 9.5 billion, with m much of that growth, the additional 3 billion, occurring in the developing world. So there, there's our prognosis. That's what we have to be planning for as we go into the century. It's sensible to plan 50 years ahead. So what, what does that mean, a, a population uh, of, uh, of 9 billion? Well, I, I think all of the issues that I'm talking about, the new challenges, follow from that <coughs> population. We take water resource. The extrapolations of available fresh water and the demands of this growing population with growing aspirations, of course, are that without new technology, uh, the, the fresh water supply no longer meets demand by mid-century. I say without new technology, and that's why I've coupled food and water. We need more food crop per drop, right? And that's exactly what <coughs> GM technology can deliver. The next question, of course, is, but do we have societies that are accepting of the advances of science? And in this country, we know the people have voted with their feet, and GM technology has virtually died in our major industries. Although, five years ago, we were very much in the lead. So, societal acceptance of the available technology is also a major factor in whether we're going to manage this. Of course, what, what I don't want to pass over is the fact that fresh water and food distribution is also a problem. In other words, the, the fresh water is already not there in Darfur, which is creating a crisis. So we, we need also to look at redistribution much more seriously as we move forward in time. Just take energy security and supply. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the oil people. Uh, there's a finite amount of oil under the crust of the, the planet, and at some point, you would think the oil will dry up. At least it will no longer meet demand, or will it? Well, the economists tell us the price of oil will simply go up. It is going up. And as the price of oil goes up, technology delivers alternatives. And quite simply, we know how to convert coal into oil. The Sassol process in my own country, South Africa, has, has delivered that very, very clearly. And with the price of oil where it is today, the coal liquefaction process becomes economic. And so we know there's a solution because there's enough coal around and because technology can deliver that. Uh, by the way, I should also say on water, desalination is a route forward, but we need much cheaper routes to good desalination processes. So once again, a demand on technology. Health, but Energy security, if we talk about the amount of coal we've got, we can manage for hundreds of years. That's not the issue. So in terms of energy, we've got another problem which I come to. Health and disease, well, we've all heard about the H5N1 avian flu uh, virus. And that virus has been around since about 1995, and it still hasn't got to the Americas. Right? It's been moving around, and it's moved around by wild bird movement, and by poultry movement. But it still hasn't got to the Americas, it'll get there. Um, but if it became a human-to-human -human virus, if the virus changed and became human-to-human, -human, how long would it take before it was in every country in the world? That's been modeled, not least by Neil Ferguson, who you mentioned. It would take about three months. And there's not a country that would be left out of the epidemic. So we're in a very different situation because of globalization, the movement of people. If we have a new disease breaking out somewhere and it's highly infectious, we see it spread very rapidly. This is a challenge for us. And we need to redirect energy because the technology can at least reduce the impact of these things. Well, I've been pushing very hard for the development of a device that looks exactly like a mobile phone, but over the end of it would have a DNA chip, so that people in the field could stick this into the, uh, I'm going to say, orifice of an animal, <laughs> and determine exactly what disease the animal has. And if you read off um, that it's got uh, H5N1, you just ping it through to Geneva using the 
satellite technology that every mobile phone uses. If you had such a device available to you, you then get the possibility of discovering a new disease emerging, such as H5N1 given, somewhere in the world, and pour all your resources into quenching it before it becomes a human pandemic. Now, that, that sort of thing is difficult to drive through because the profit motive alone appears to be insufficient. I don't know why, because if I had such a device on the market, I imagine I would sell it worldwide. But uh, whatever it is, the technology in principle is there, but we're still to see uh, the private sector develop it. So disease, I would suggest we've got a new phenomenon we're faced with. By the way, if an H5N1 human, I don't want panic in the room, as this isn't like Northern Rock. <laughs> but, uh, but if H5N1 human did develop, within three months we'd have it, within a, about a month later it would have passed through our population. So it would go very quickly through the population and of course a potentially high fatality rate if we haven't prepared ourselves well. That's one of the factors that, uh, that I'm faced with advising government on. Environment and climate change is what I'm really going to develop the theme on. This is in a different category from the others. The other problems can be dealt with with, uh, with technological developments and through the marketplace. But here with, with the environment, we have a situation where uniquely, apart from one circumstance, we require global agreement to deal with the problem because we're talking about a common factor which is the shared environment around the planet. So what, what we actually are faced with is, I think, the biggest challenge since our civilization began, is a big statement, because it requires a collective response of our civilization. Can we manage this problem? And I'm, I'm raising that question as I uh, continue with this. Now, I, I've coupled this in with the other threat for the 21st century, which is uh, uh, terrorism my getting lost here. Um, terrorism, I'm not going to suggest, is entirely related to all these factors, but I think it's exacerbated by them. So when we, when we talk about climate change and look at the impacts of climate change this century, I think I'm going to show you that terrorism becomes more of an issue, conflict becomes more of an issue, as driven by climate change impacts. Um, and we therefore need to try and gear up and prepare ourselves in advance for, for, these, uh, for these impacts. Sustainability, well, I, I see this as the overriding issue. So what we're now talking about is um, the, the sort of consumerism that so effectively drove our economies in the 20th century. The question I'm raising here is, is that going to be the opposite model for the 21st century? Do we have the resources to manage the aspirations of 9.5 billion people in perhaps the rather wasteful way that we've been using resources in the 20th century. So I, I think sustainability becomes uh, the key word as we move forward. So I'm actually suggesting some re-gearing of our thinking so that we focus on uh, the new 21st century challenges. And delighted to see that Imperial College's new structure has developed over the last 10 years really does prepare it for this, uh, for this century. When I talk about sustainable development, um, I mean, last night in the audience we had a, an editor from The Economist and I was saying, I would really like to turn, I, I read The Economist weekly and I'd like to turn to the back page of The Economist and see not just GDP growth, and I do check this and we are rising at 3% per annum and you know, we're not doing too badly. But I, I'd like to see a measure of the wealth of a nation also shown there so that we can aspire to see our wealth increasing. And I would use Das Gupta's uh, definition. So the wealth, he, he says, is our ability to generate well-being for our people. And this depends on manufactured capital, human capital, natural and environmental capital, and institutions and cultural forms. So are we increasing our wealth, or is it, are we depleting our wealth as we move forward in time? Of course, if you look at the, the environmental and natural uh, capital, you could be talking about coal, oil, or gold reserves under the ground. So as you deplete those reserves, according to this, your wealth is diminishing, 
unless you put that wealth back into the first two items, the, uh, the, the manufactured and the <coughs> capital. But so you need to reinvest from the profits of mining if you're really going to continue to grow your wealth. And that's quite a, a good exercise for any country. But at the same time, what about environmental? What that means is that we need to, in the economist terms, internalize the external costs of any degradation to the environment. And then, then we can start talking, I think, sensibly. This, by the way, is not an empty request. I'm challenging the economist to think hard about this because we all tend to look at GDP growth as the be-all and end-all. And when I say we all, perhaps you don't, but all of us in government watch that number very closely. Let's get back to, to the, the climate. The Earth's atmosphere, well, we know uh, that um, uh, uh, over the period of development uh, since that Industrial Revolution in Manchester not too long ago, our period of development has impacted quite seriously on the, on the atmosphere. I was in South Africa lecturing uh, at the CSIR in Pretoria last week. And from the lecture theatre, as I stood up, I could see out the window Johannesburg in the distance, and the pool of pollution overlying the city immediately told me, and I didn't know this before, not, but I made it as my opening comment, that South Africa hadn't yet introduced regulations for car exhaust systems. So although the platinum used in the back end of motor cars everywhere else in the world comes from South Africa, they haven't yet regulated uh, car exhausts. And yet every city where those regulations are introduced is cleaned up. Uh, pretty well spontaneous. So we are learning how to cope with our environment. The marketplace doesn't deliver that. We have to regulate. Um, so part of this process is what is the better regulation system. And the car exhaust catalyst is a very good example of that because even today in Europe, the standards expected from next year's catalyst are always pressure pushing down on parts per million emitted from the back end of a car. So we're, we're learning all of that, but one thing, when I first came to Imperial College, my first port of call from South Africa in 1963, we still had a smog in London. So I it managed to experience that. And then coal fires were banned in, in London, <coughs> and the smogs came to an end. We understood, although we didn't use the word, that carbon nanoparticles were driving smog. And so in incomplete combustion of coal was the key factor in the, in the smog. So we just went for complete combustion because we all thought that carbon dioxide was colorless, tasteless, and odorless, and therefore surely was a pretty harmless gas. Now, of course, so we, we've been managing all of these other things, but what we haven't managed is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Just before I move on, there at the top we've got the stratosphere, and we know the importance of the ozone layer in protecting us uh, and other mammals from uh, the uh, radiation from outer space and the, the way that was depleted through our use of CO2. Now, the Montreal Protocol is the one prior example where we did manage to make a collective action. All nations took that seriously. And by the middle of this century, all the indications are that the ozone depletion will have recovered and we will get our protective layer back. So we can, we can actually manage these problems, although I'm not going to pretend that managing CFC emissions is in the same class as managing the use of fossil fuels. Now, just to underline the, the history of the, of the development of uh, our understanding of the warming of the planet, um, this, this figure enables me to go back to 1827 to the French mathematician Fourier. So Fourier simply says, that he was, a, let's say, quite an arrogant man, and he said, listen, I've got enough knowledge that I should be able to calculate the average temperature of the planet. I know what's heating it. Imagine the planet was cold, and it was suddenly exposed to sunlight, it would warm up, 
and it would keep warming up until the amount of radiation going back into space exactly balanced the amount of sunlight warming the planet. So he said the amount of red stuff going out equals the amount of yellow stuff coming in, and the amount of radiation going out he knew was a very sensitive function of the temperature, the fourth power of the temperature. So he thought, I've, I've got a very good handle on the temperature. We have delta T and TQ. <coughs> so basically, he calculates it and he finds a temperature of minus 15 degrees centigrade. But he also did a, a, a Gedunken experiment. He said, What if I shut off the sunlight? That means all this radiation goes pouring out into space, cooling the Earth's surface. And in 10 hours, it would cool calculation, integration, another 15 degrees centigrade. So what he knew he calculated was a nighttime daytime temperature difference of 15 degrees centigrade, and his uh, absolute temperature was too low. So it couldn't match with reality. Now what he realized he had done was calculate the properties of a sphere in space that had no atmosphere. So this was appropriate for the moon, but inappropriate for the Earth. So he then puts in the blue stuff in the figure, and, uh, of course, being Fourier introduces a coefficient. <laughs> <laughs> and his coefficient is simply, and quite smartly, the amount of the radiated energy that's absorbed by the atmosphere, thereby warming up the atmosphere so the blanket gives a higher average temperature and also means that the nighttime daytime temperature difference is smaller. So the blanket is still there at night, and keeps the Earth warm. He then finally publishes his paper, uh, and he gets the nighttime daytime temperature difference roughly right, but his coefficient is his fudge factor. He's fed the coefficient in to get the numbers right. And so um, uh, you now come to, of course, a British scientist who says, hang on, uh, we can't just have this fudge factor in there. Uh, let's, uh, let's measure this. And Tyndall then measures the amount of radiated energy absorbed by the atmosphere. Tyndall, 1860, um, first of all, cleans up his sample of the atmosphere, careful British scientist, removes all the minority gases, carbon dioxide and water vapor, and he finds the coefficient is zero. Right, so what Tyndall then famously does is repeat the experiment with dirty air and he gets the coefficient correct. So he had discovered that it was the minority gases, carbon dioxide and water vapor, and not most of the atmosphere, oxygen and nitrogen, that were absorbing that radiated energy. We, we would now express that differently. Hermitatic, hermonuclear, diatomic molecules do not absorb any infrared radiation. So you need a slightly bigger molecule like water or carbon dioxide. <coughs> So that, that of the story is roughly getting us to the point where we arrive at uh, Sancta Arrhenius, 1896, who says, hang on, we're burning fossil fuels. What if we change the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? That greenhouse effect of, of Fourier is, is very important for our human and mammal development. It's given us the right temperature. But what if we upset the balance by putting too much carbon dioxide up? So 1896, uh, Nobel Prize winner Arrhenius uh, publishes a paper, the first paper, estimating how much the Earth's surface temperature would rise just using Tyndall's coefficients for carbon dioxide and water vapor and using Fourier's equation. And he says if the carbon dioxide level should double, the temperature should rise an average of 5 degrees centigrade. He's not, not far off. We now have the world's biggest computers with everything you could possibly think of built into it, <coughs> including, by the way, solar activity, including volcanic activity, including everything that those armchair critics think the scientists haven't thought of, all putting all of that in there, and you still get a temperature rise which is around the figure that uh, the temperature came to. Most of us would say, therefore, we understood the physics by the turn of that century. There are complications and I don't want to pretend there are. So for example, that little white bit of fluff on the left there, the cloud, is a, is a massive complication. You'll see that the, the estimate on this is 20% of sunlight reflected by clouds. 
that allows us two functions. One is to keep the radiated energy in, so to keep us warm at night, but if they're good white clouds, their albedo is high and they reflect the sunlight out. So cl cloud behavior is complicated, and as the carbon dioxide levels go up, water vapor pressures go up, cloud behavior changes, and trying to calculate that is quite a challenge. The other big challenge is, um, is the role of, of small particles in the atmosphere. Uh, aerosols are uh, difficult to calculate, but they also cover a whole range, because there's a big difference between one type of aerosol and another. So the behavior of these emitted emissions that we produce in our industries is a, is a, is a big complication. So we, we still need more work on this, but basically the problem is pretty well understood. Now the other thing that has happened more recently is the vast amount of very sophisticated data that has come in, uh, particularly over the last 10 years. We have a full range of satellite data and also a range of data taken from ocean sediments and from ice cores taken from around the world. And this has really increased our database in terms of understanding the behavior of the planet over uh, quite a long period of time. And when I say quite a long period of time, there's a stunning paper that I'm referring to here, uh, Federoff's work published in Science in 2006, in which they uh, go back 60 million years plus <coughs> with a proxy of temperature from uh, oxygen isotopes in water. So the temperature axis goes up on the vertical <coughs> axis, and we're going back 60 million years from the present time, uh, zero, on the, on the right. Now, what this shows is what, uh, what is already understood from analysis of rock formation and uh, plants and, and animal species. Uh, this is the that the Earth's temperature peaked about 55 million years ago, that Eocene-Pliocene transition period. And that peak would be about 7 or 8 degrees centigrade higher than it is now. And there was no ice left on the planet. Antarctica was a tropical forest. And you wouldn't want to have real estate anywhere else. It was, it was pretty hot. Um, so, Temperature then falls and takes quite a while. Carbon dioxide levels estimate up here, probably about 1,000, 1,500 <coughs> parts per minute. So we've got a very high carbon dioxide level. It takes quite a long time to get rid of that. You'll see that after 3 million years, the temperature has fallen to almost the level that we're currently at. If you're thinking this is noise in the data, that, of course, isn't noise. That's the beginning of the bi-stability in the temperature system of the planet, where we have two limits in the temperature, which we tend to call the ice age and the warm period. We go into these oscillations um, as the stability uh, it hits this, uh, this regime. They're clearly a big nonlinear driving factor. And this is just expanding that over the last 400,000 years. This is ice core data. We've got ice core data now going back 850,000 years. And this is a warm period, back into an ice age, warm period, and so on. <coughs> the temperature difference, 5, 6, 7 degrees centigrade between a warm period and an ice age. Sea level difference, roughly 100 meters. Because, of course, uh, as we go from an ice age into a warm period, the land-based ice is going to go into the ocean, and the ocean is warmer and expands. So sea level rises by about 100 meters. So the map of the world changes as we oscillate through these. Uh, you'll notice that in previous warm periods, they're very short, and they tend to uh, dive back down towards uh, an ice age again. This one. This is our present, present warm period, starting here 12,000 years ago. It's been remarkably constant. <coughs> I believe that happens to be uh, the beginning of our Anthropocene. In other words, the impact of human civilization is already coming through here, through the development of agriculture and the change of land use, because, of course, the, the trees were a carbon dioxide pump. And we were changing that down. So if you look now at the red, that's the carbon dioxide levels, you'll see that unusually, emerging from this ice age, the carbon dioxide kept going up. And then, 
this vertical line isn't an accident. That, uh, that is what happened post the Industrial Revolution, the start of New Manchester. I'm not really trying to blame that. <laughs> Right, so carbon dioxide levels in the warm period is about 260 parts per million, but in this warm period, just rising a bit more. Uh, and in the ice age, it's about 200 parts per million. This is a complex coupling. I don't want to suggest that it's a direct <coughs> linear coupling. Uh, clearly, something other than carbon dioxide kicks this off, and that's the change in the Earth's orbit that has a 100,000 year cycle. But this here is the, the rising carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution began and taking us to the point where we're at uh, last year, 383 parts per million. And it's rising so that this year is 385. It's about two parts per million per annum. And so you can calculate very simply when we're going to pass 400 parts per million. And that's quite significant because in international terms, we're now discussing whether or not it's possible to reach a plateau at 450 parts per million carbon dioxide equivalent, and this is just carbon dioxide. By equivalent, I mean adding the impact of methane and other uh, greenhouse gases together. All right, so what are the impacts of that rising carbon dioxide? And here in red, I show the average Earth's temperature going back to the point, actually data started coming in in 1863, developed by our Met office using 300 weather stations around the world. So these are the averages and then uh, we move forward in time and that's the rise in temperature that uh, was predicted by the models uh, um, emerging from the Hadley Center. So this is the Hadley Center model in grey, published somewhere around this time, predicting this, this rise. And then they run the Hadley Center model backwards, and you'll see they get a pretty good description of the prior behavior. If you don't include the change in carbon dioxide over this period in their models, then you get all sorts of ups and downs due to volcanic eruptions, solar activity, but you don't see any trend change from left, left to right. So the models are very clearly saying this is a change in greenhouse gas driven uh, 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 factor, i.e. it is anthropogenic. Let's just move to Central Europe and I think you'll see why I'm showing you this. But the first point I want to make is why is everyone referring to Hadley Centre as the lead model in the world? Well, the answer is quite simple. That the Hadley Centre is actually part of the Met Office. The Met Office provides the weather forecast service for the eastern United States, for Europe, uh, and for a big part of the world. It's, it's one of the two leading Met Offices in the world. And the way they do it is to, to run their, their models forward in time, and it's totally deterministic. So they include in their model everything around the planet that is going on weather-wise, and then predict how the movements that they're using will turn out over the next 24 hours, three days, three months, depending on whether you have a look at a short-term weather forecast or a long-term weather forecast. But their models can be run forward over a much longer period of time, and that's what in, is included here. So what, what I'm just showing you is running the Met Office models with different initiating points so when I take an, an initiating point, it's taking all the data from around the world and reinitiating the model, say at 6 o'clock this morning, and running it to predict what the weather's going to be like for the next 24 hours. So they reinitiate the program. But if you take several different reinitiations, you get all these red plots up here. And of course, what I'm showing you is this is the weather. The trend is the climate change. So within the Met Office model that predicts your weather is the climate change uh, uh, as, as part of that deterministic process. So, of course, what they have to do is feed in a scenario for future carbon dioxide levels because the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are included in their model. Now, what I've superimposed in black here is the actual Central European uh, summer temperature. 
And you'll see, of course, the, the Met Office models are not predicting the weather, but the trends are going pretty well. And then we hit this extreme here. Now, the models sometimes show extremes, but uh, at different points in time. So this, the hot summer in Central Europe of 2003, which is that point, was not predicted long term by the models, but you can nevertheless see that it was predicting extreme weather events would lead to very hot summers in Central Europe. Now was that hot summer a climate change event? 50,000 people lost their lives in Central Europe as a result of that. Well, if you look at this, you'll see the hottest summer in the 20th century was uh, 1947 in Central Europe. Now, if you scan across, you'll see that the average temperature is pretty well around the same as the hottest temperature of the 20th century. So the baseline temperature rise is already rising to the point where we've reached the hottest temperature of the 20th century. So when you get a very hot summer, it's sitting on this higher baseline. And another way of drawing your attention to this is to say, well, take this line. Where do we hit the point where the average European temperature would be the same as that summer of 2003? And you can see it's about mid-century. And then, of course, when we have a severely hot summer, we've got to expect it to be sitting above this, this baseline. Now, that, in summary, is the nature of the impacts for a particular part of the world that we've got to expect. How much can we change that? In other words, if we were to say, stop carbon dioxide emissions around the planet today at 385 parts per million, how would that change this? And the answer is, unfortunately, not very much out to uh, about this point, uh, uh, sorry, out to about this point here. So for the next 30 years or so, because of the inertia of the climate system and the rapid rise in carbon dioxide that's taking place, for the next 30 years, the change is already in the pipeline. Now, that's quite an important message because it means we have to prepare for the impacts of higher temperatures, changes in rainfall patterns, and so on, that are already in the pipeline for the next 30 years. But when you go beyond this point, now the predictions become very strongly scenario-dependent. Now, here's, here's a little problem uh, for a scientist working uh, in government. The European <coughs> Union has stated very clearly, and all, all 27 countries signed up to this, we will not allow the global temperature to exceed 2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Right, now you, you come to a scientist and you say, what do we have to do in terms of carbon dioxide level to stay below 2 degrees centigrade. Now my, my answer, I'm afraid, is, well, we shouldn't be where we are now. <laughs> if we were having this discussion in 1950, we might just about manage that. Because, and this is some data I asked the Hadley Center to produce, this is a probability distribution function for an ultimate level of 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this is the Relative probability, that's the global temperature change. And you can see, it, and many people just read off the maximum. That's not a terribly meaningful thing to do. But the, it peaks at 2.2 degrees centigrade, even for 450 parts per million, and let me stress, carbon dioxide equivalent. So this is now adding in all the other greenhouse gases. Well, what is the Median. Well, the median is actually 2.5 because of the tail. This is a non-Gaussian curve. So the tail on the distribution is saying already the median is about 2.5 degrees centigrade rise above the EU stated objective. But what about this big tail here? Risk management is a key part of my job. And risk management doesn't mean just look at the most likely outcome. It also means you have to look at the low probability, severe impact outcome. So even at 450 degrees centigrade, sorry, 450 parts per million, shouldn't we be planning for a potential rise of around 3.5, 3.7 degrees centigrade? That would be the 95% confidence limit is around 1.7 degree temperature rise. That would be great. 
but all the way up to 3.7. So if it's right for governors to manage risks to their population on this 95% confidence <coughs> limit, then we ought to really be planning for a minimum temperature rise of, I say minimum temperature rise, planning for a potential temperature rise of 3.7, even at this well-behaved global system. We're not going to manage, this is a tough thing to say, to stay below 450 parts per minute. With the best will in the world, and I mean those words. So if we go to 550 parts per minute, once again, look at the tail. It's going out. We're creeping up into regions where the impacts, planet-wise, really become extremely uncomfortable. All this really says is, for goodness sake, let's get agreement to stay as low as possible. If we look at the impacts, we can see that we're really courting catastrophe if we go beyond 550 parts per minute. So my advice to government is we ought to be trying to get international agreement to stay as close to 450 as possible and certainly not to exceed 550 equivalent. Well, these property distribution functions are about as good as international science can currently do and I have to keep repeating that to politicians. However hard you try, you can't squeeze that down to a narrower distribution function, not at the moment. Projected impacts of climate change, we, we can evaluate that from all the worldwide science going on, and this has been summarized in the Intergovernmental Panel uh, on Climate Change report published this year. And you'll see that if you start going at the moment, we had a temperature rise of about 0.7 degrees centigrade. If you go out to the level I was talking about, 4 degrees centigrade, you can see that we have a whole range of impacts through from food, water, ecosystems, extreme weather events, etc., that come into play. I'm not going to dwell on that in any detail, but what I just want to focus on is an icon of change that the climate scientists have picked on, uh, and that is uh, the ice on Greenland. If we ignore the heating of the, uh, of the oceans, and if we ignore the loss of ice anywhere else, if we just lost the ice from, uh, from Greenland, it all melted and entered the ocean, sea level rise would be six and a half meters. And of course, London would, uh, would no longer be defensible. Defendable. So, this is something surely we don't want to, uh, to test our models against. <laughs> We can all agree, let's try and keep the Greenland ice in place. <coughs> now, the Hadley Centre have tried to model this, and I, I, I'm afraid my caricature of their initial attempt to model it is rather like taking a block of ice out of a refrigerator, placing it on a table, and modelling how long it would take to, to melt and what the conditions would be for its melting. In other words, what temperature rise would. Now, actually, what's taking place on Greenland doesn't match that very well. And I, I'll just show you what is happening. And they, they show you with uh, a beautiful piece of, of science. I, I think it's absolutely stunning. Um, what I'm showing you here is the change in the gravitational field of the Greenland as a result of the loss of ice. Right, so how do you measure the change in the gravitational field? You use two satellites. One satellite is changing its altitude for example, if it goes over Mount Everest, it ducks down and then goes up again because of the change in the gravitational field, higher mountain range. So the one that's going up and down, the, the second satellite is monitoring the front satellite very accurately. So the second satellite has to be going over a flat region such as the ocean. And using these two satellites, um, these Gravitational field diagrams have been produced covering a period of, uh, of around five years. And the data were really quite surprising because it turns out we're losing. The, you, by the way, you can see the, the blue area maps out, if you can just see Greenland behind there, the blue area maps out Greenland pretty accurately. I think the, the scientists are pretty happy with that. And it gives you a global figure. Any other figure, such as altimetry, would say, well, this piece of Greenland is losing ice, but this piece is gaining, whereas this is giving you a gross integrated figure of the loss of ice. And it's losing ice, if you look at the two figures below, 
at the rate of about 200 cubic kilometers per hour. That's summer ice, 200 cubic kilometers per hour. Now, there's an awful lot of ice there in Greenland. So it's going to take quite a while before that uh, gives rise to that six and a half meter uh, rise. But the worrying thing is that it's happening much faster than any of the modelers had predicted. Is that irreversible? We don't know yet. So obviously these measurements will continue. Why is it happening? Well, the answer is because instead of like that block of ice on the table, gradually creating a pool around it, uh, what actually happens is that the, the runoff melt creates rivers. The rivers create waterfalls or called moonons. And these run right down to the base of Greenland, the, the land below, and start lubricating between the ice and the land. And so you get premature carving of big chunks of ice. So that wasn't included. So we have icebergs being generated from the land as a result. Right, so uh, a pretty neat challenge for the modelers to see if they can create moulons and then uh, uh, remodel uh, the conditions for Greenland. Um, observed sea level rise, now you can use altimetry. So this is satellites accurately measuring change in sea level over a period since 1993. And you'll see that uh, the sea level change is, is, uh, is fairly consistent. Those skeptics who tell you that they've been sitting on the Maldives and hadn't detected a change in sea level rise. Uh, it's a wonderful place to sit. Um, I'm sure that's a good reason for doing it. Uh, what, what you need to know, of course, is that with all the circulation of water in the ocean, the oceans aren't like a tub of water absolutely flat. They're up and down and all over the place, as this data shows. And what you need to, to, to do is use a satellite so that you take average measurements all over the planet. Uh, and when you do that, then there's a uh, little doubt. Uh, the sea levels are rising, and again, this fits with the, the model expected. So the sea level rise is pretty close to the, the model expectation. What does that mean if you translate that into um, creating inhabitable environments from previously habitable environments as we move forward in time, i.e. number of people who would be displaced from their normal place of living? Well, you see that the numbers are frighteningly large. So if you, if you, if you look at the, the, the top figure here, you'll see that uh, we're talking in 50s, uh, 50 millions and it depends where you're looking on the planet. Japan, uncomfortable. Uh, India, very uncomfortable. The whole of the Malaysian uh, uh, area, uncomfortable as well. Now, th this is a very crude map. Uh, it's accurate, but it's crude because it, it would make you think that Britain is fine, and I'm coming to the point of coming in. <laughs> Actually, it's not all that good. I suggest that those linear macroeconomic models, which, which the economists are endlessly discussing, will not pick up what we're seeing here. In other words, the point at which confidence in the globalized economy becomes stretched by people shifting from their normal place of habituation. The challenges to our globalized economy from the geopolitical destabilization that this would imply are simply massive. And I don't think any economic model captures it. These are big nonlinear uh, impacts and, uh, and confidence is what the, the marketplace is all about. Can we manage it? Well, the top uh, uh, figure here is business as usual. If we could stay down below 550 parts per million, then we can reduce the problem very substantially. And, uh, this is a slightly confusing graph because now this is the degree to which these scenarios are mitigated. So if I take the, the blue line here, it means 80 to 90% mitigation. You, that means the impact is one-tenth of what it would be if we take the business as usual scenario. That's a massive argument for international action. <coughs> What that's really saying is that in the longer term, 2080 plus, we can really manage this problem very substantially. We can reduce its impact on human populations. There's the UK. I, I ran a foresight program beginning in 2002 
picking on, on the, the country and the world's best scientists, engineers, social scientists, <coughs> economists who work with us, uh, uh, just over 100 of them, for two and a half years to analyze the risks to the UK from out to 2018 using the best data available from the climate scientists. First country in the world to have had this analysis conducted. We have now taken the same group of people out to China and they're working in the Yangtze Basin area uh, uh, an agreement by signed with the Chinese government. What this shows, this is the left hand is the best scenario, so we stay at around 500 parts per million. And the right hand is the worst case scenario where we keep business as usual. And the colouring simply indicates that the changing risk to the built environment as we move forward in time. Now, you may ask, well, surely it would only be the, the coastal towns that would be at risk. Not at all, because the, as, as the climate changes, gets warmer, so we get more water vapour in the air, and so when we get precipitation, when we get rainfall, it, it's much more intense. And so what we expect from the models, and this was published many years ago, is increased flash flooding in our city. Right, so what, what we're actually saying is, for Britain, the biggest risks are from flooding because of the change in rainfall patterns. Um, as we move forward in time, we're going to shift into an arena where instead of having that miserable drizzle all the time, <laughs> we will have sudden rainfall. The overall rainfall pattern will increase somewhat, but it's the way the rain comes down that is changing. And we're already experiencing it. So the, the cities, with their drainage systems and their sewage systems, which <coughs> the Victorians bless them, decided to join together. Yeah, I mean, the biggest problem with flash floods is that it's sewage that comes up into the streets, and recovering from that is the major problem. Um, th those systems are no longer fit to purpose as we move towards mid-century. And so the outcome of this foresight program is saying to government, you need to spend more money as we move forward in this century on flood and coastal defense management. We said we were talking about uh, one billion pounds by 2015. The government is already committed by 2011 to increasing it to 700 million. Today it's 500 million. Now there are big questions about the floods this year, um, but at the same time this program of work is inevitably going to take time. So we can't expect to have managed the problem that quickly. All I can say is we are still the only country in the world with a program uh, aimed at managing impacts of climate change. Right, what the basic message is, I think, critically important. Because of that stuff in the pipeline, because of the impacts playing through, we have to adapt. We c it's not a choice between adaptation and mitigation now. We have to adapt. And those countries that can afford to adapt, I believe will do it because the impacts are already coming through. But also globally we need to mitigate so that in the longer term, all of us have a manageable problem. I mean, frankly, the problem can become unmanageable for all of us if it becomes catastrophic. And by catastrophic I mean, and I haven't yet shown any data showing this, if we get into massive non-linearity. So, for example, a loss of the tropical rainforests, which would mean the rainforests becoming net emitters of carbon dioxide instead of net pumps, or the emergence of methane from the methane hydrates. So, any, any big emergence of non-linearity like that has not been included in these models and would lead to uh, a very sudden rise. That's what we need to avoid. That's the catastrophe we don't, uh, we don't want to happen. Carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels, this is the global emissions rising through last century. If you look at the international uh, outlook, um, th that's continuing to rise. And of course, the development of China and India very much, if I can use the phrase, stoking this up. <laughs> that's business as usual. And this is really where we want to be. So business as usual, uh, this is gigatons of carbon dioxide emitted worldwide as a function of time. Business as usual would rise up on the red curve. 
If we want to stay at 450 parts per million, we would have to be on this curve here, and if we're prepared to go up to 550, the blue curve. So I'm saying we need to be in there, and as close to that red curve as possible, but it's a very big challenge. You'll see that the red curve means globally, emissions start dropping pretty well <coughs> this year, and we need to be on a trajectory which cuts through the emissions in developed countries and in developing countries. Right, so we have to have China, India, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, the other developing countries on board this uh, program if we're going to manage that. And here's the political problem. We go into negotiations, and I've been heavily involved in all of this, um, and you've got the countries in this blue box, USA and Canada, where the annual emission per person is above 25 tonnes per person per annum of carbon dioxide, trying to negotiate with countries in the black box where the emissions per person are around three or four tonnes per person per annum. And the, the black box people, actually not just the black box people, but all of these people here, are saying, but it's you guys up there. You should deal with the problem. Now, this is the population along here, and I just want to point out it's the area of the boxes that matters. So if you, if you eyeball integrate the area, you can see that um, the amount of emissions from the countries over here are beginning to match these here. So the multiplier, the population of the country, then becomes a crucial factor. But it's pretty hopeless for us to say, well, you've got to reduce the area of your box when their emissions per person are so much smaller than ours. And that's the nature of the political problem. So in the negotiations where I'm saying we have to have an agreement by early 2009. How do we get an agreement that is seen to be equitable by that range of, the, of nations? The Brazilians have a very simple proposal. They're simply saying, this is historical. So why don't we integrate emissions back to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? <laughs> <laughs> Not a silly uh, suggestion, but would the United States, would Britain, would Germany agree to that? You know, it, it would mean that we really have to take the substantial burden. Now, the first element of an agreement would be to say, let's extrapolate to the end of the century and see what, what the emissions per person... Sorry, just one point about these boxes. This box... These boxes here, not increasing in time substantially. <coughs> Population demographics, I come back to, stable. These boxes are increasing in both dimensions. So if we take East Asia, increasing because of development and increasing because of population expansion. So you've got two dimensions of increase over there. If we extrapolate to the end of the century, can't we all agree that the emissions per person on the planet should be 2.5 tons per person per annum? And then extrapolate back country by country, with some countries having a peak and dropping and other countries diminishing immediately. I think that's the only sort of way that we're likely to get uh, an equitable solution. But I, I think that summarizes the reason why we haven't yet got a solution. This is the processes we've been through. Intergovernmental panel on climate change developed so that the science is driving the whole process. Absolutely right. And then we get the political system involved, 1992. We get the Kyoto process agreed, so-called, in 97, but no real adherence to it. And here we are, 2007. During 2005, during the British government's G8 presidency, we decided to invite the rapidly emerging powers, that little group of China, India, Mexico, Brazil, and South Africa, to the meeting. We invited those heads of states because we knew we can't manage this problem without them. 
And that discussion has continued. It continued in Mexico in 2006, and it continued with the Germans this year. And next year, uh, it will continue in Japan, and I believe the Italians, uh, and perhaps I shouldn't say it so quickly after meeting them yesterday, are going to agree to put it on their agenda in 2009. Now, by 2009, I'm saying we need to arrive at that meeting with an agreed process so that we can all just get the heads of states to, to put their final stamp of approval on it. That's, uh, that's quite a tall order. Let me just... Th th this is really to say, well, actually, the developed nations have already got into hand a system, this is uh, America and Britain economy growing here, where they've decoupled economic growth from carbon dioxide emissions. Partly that's because we're getting more efficient at uh, energy usage, but I'm afraid partly it's because most of our economic growth is in the services sector. And that's not a high carbon dioxide sector. Let's just take a quick look at energy policy. Any, any energy policy has to be aimed for the center here. So the energy policy must pr provide lights that are always on, otherwise governments get elected out. <laughs> uh, keep the energy costs low so that our economy stays competitive and reduce emissions according to a national partner. So for any country, you need to be sitting in here. And the UK has put out two white papers in a relatively short period of time. The first in 2003 where we announced we were going to reduce our emissions by 60% by 2050. And then, frankly, in 2007, we revisited it because we realized we hadn't actually uh, worked it out in fine detail. Right, so it's a much bigger challenge than was initially thought. If we now look at roughly, and this is just a diagrammatic representation of uh, British government policy represented in the latest white paper, we are starting at this point in 2007 and saying we want to be down at this point by 2050. How do we manage it? Well, the first thing we introduced was renewables obligation for each of the utilities. So every utility has an ob obligation to produce a certain amount of renewables electricity on the grid. And that obligation is proceeding quite well. But I, I have to tell you, we've got two gigawatts of wind turbine energy up now, potential energy, and another eight and a half gigawatts caught up in planning permission. So while 85% of the population say, yes, let's have uh, more renewable energy, as soon as you ask them locally, and can we have it here, we get the usual answer. This, this is local democracy, and it may be that there's a saturation point, and we need to work within that. Um, that's not going to solve the problem, so we introduce energy efficiency gains. Here's the big win. Energy efficiency, I'm going to show you, is an area where economically we win and in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. Now, if we don't build new nuclear power stations um, uh, and build them fairly quickly, all of the benefits from these first two wedges would disappear by 2020. At the moment, we're down to 19% for our electricity on the grid from nuclear. It used to be 30% because we're not building new nuclear power stations. By 2020, we're left with sizable fee unless we substantially extend the lifetime of the others. And so, we would be actually back to square one if we lose nuclear power. On the other hand, if we replace our old power stations with a much more efficient power station, now on the market, we would gain an extra wedge. And that's the simple reason why I have been saying we're not going to manage this problem without new nuclear fields. So either we have a negative wedge for nuclear or we get a positive wedge. Uh, and I, I, I believe we therefore have to face one more generation of nuclear fission power while the alternatives play through into the system. Carbon capture and storage, you'll see we need every tool in the bag. Transport, one quarter of our emissions from transport, and that's a rising factor because we're getting the other things under control. Decentralized energy and microgeneration, there's an enormous amount of headroom in the UK 
That's a big factor about the built environment and so looking at regulations in the built environment heading towards a built environment that may even be gridless where you're farming energy from the environment of, uh, of each building and where for example when it's daylight outside and the sun is shining you switch on the light and you would switch on a light pipe allowing light into a uh, into a lecture theatre like this instead of using uh, electricity. Combined heat and power and finally I'm there we, we really have to include heat into this if we're going to manage the whole problem. Uh, geothermal energy has potential but here I'm simply putting together available technologies with one exception, carbon capture and storage and th this is why the government is now starting a, a demonstration on one of our coal-fired uh, power stations to retrofit it for carbon capture and storage where the storage will take place into a saline aquifer. If we just do it into a depleted oil well, we won't learn anything new. We rarely have to find out whether we can use saline aquifers and if we can, that opens up uh, the use, the continued use of coal as we move forward in time. Around midpoint here or before, we will have international pressure on the developed nations to go beyond that 60% reduction. And we need to prepare for that. So where's the extra wedge that appears? Well, that extra wedge comes from further developments. Further developments. <laughs> You're laughing, I was going to say the further developments are up to you. <laughs> this is the engineering and technology community and I'm challenging that community to go out and develop uh, uh, these technologies. And there, there, there is so much headroom. If you just take photovoltaics, uh, we're still fixed on silicon photovoltaics, necessarily expensive. Plastic, ceramic photovoltaics <coughs> would completely transform the field. And yet the amount of work on silicon compared with others is massive. Why don't we start working on more practical materials for photovoltaics? We've got some good examples of uh, sustainable cities. Um, I'm going to simply say the government is looking into this in very fine detail because there's a massive win-win there. There's, there's a new built environment and also how we transform the old uh, built environment in terms of energy savings. Um, I've run a foresight program uh, on this. It's still running. We have uh, a, a lot of very smart people who will help government to develop the building regulations that are required to, to carry through this objective. Very busy slide, and I should apologize for a busy slide, but I'm sure there's an intelligent audience like this. <laughs> I think this is critically important. It's put out by McKinsey, um, and the, the objective here was simply to line up <coughs> what was needed by 2030 in terms of removing carbon from business as usual scenario in order to keep us below that 450 parts per million objective. So we need to remove 27 gigatons of carbon by 2030 if we're going to manage that program. And then it looks at the cost of each of these efforts to re remove carbon dioxide. The cost is given on the vertical scale in euros per tonne of carbon dioxide equivalent. So we're looking at all greenhouse gases. <coughs> I suppose the surprise for anyone first looking at this is this is the zero cost line. So if you look at the cost of abatement by introducing insulation improvements in the built environment, that it's a negative abatement cost. Right? And the negative abatement cost is 160 euros per ton. That's the economic benefit to you, the consumer, to the industrial company, etc., from simply putting through energy efficiency gains of different kinds. So all of these, not just low-hanging fruit, this is the area we should be implementing if we were just concerned about economic uh, success of companies and so on. And as a matter of fact, BP introduced carbon emissions trading around its uh, companies about five years ago. 
cost them $20 million to do the bureaucratic implementation when they saved, <coughs> in the first three years, they saved $650 million. That was the unexpected result because of these negative abatement costs. You, you'll see that you get to just over seven gigatons removed. You'll see nuclear up here. You get to seven gigatons of carbon removed but with a big financial advantage. And then the cost steps in. Anyone who can eyeball integrate will see that the area here is not very different from the area here. In other words, the total cost of removing that is pretty close to zero. There is, however, a problem. <laughs> <laughs> the marginal cost, which is greatest, you'll see, is there. Avoided deforestation in Asia, avoided deforestation in, uh, in Americas here, largely South America. Those large costs often appear in the developing world, whereas the negative abatement costs appear in the developed world. So we have a real issue about redistribution again. How, how do we manage this process, recognizing that if we're globally going to get there, we need to take all those countries with us who will have to implement on positive marginal costs. So once again, this is part of the uh, political problem. Opportunities, economic opportunities for any country like Britain getting ahead of the game. And I would suggest right now we are ahead of the rest of the world in terms of uh, creating these opportunities. We simply, the size of the market opportunities offered here in the first instance, which are very substantial. Investment in new energy <coughs> producing power delivery system over the next 20 years is around $20 trillion. And if you then uh, play into this, knowing where the politics is going, or suspecting where it's going, then you're getting ahead of the market and you're going to sell your, your goods. So the, the global markets are big. Just to point out, the EU emissions trading system has already created a market worth over £9 billion. Pounds. So creating Carbon dioxide as a negative commodity is already leading to that commodity being traded, and London is the, the major centre where that trading is taking place. I ought to look at my colleagues because I haven't been looking at my watch. Yes. <laughs> okay, let, let me just move on. I mentioned new technologies and it's quite clear that what was needed here was pump priming activity by the government. Now, this happens to be my little baby. It set up the New Energy Technologies Institute, which is a public-private partnership. We need public money to pump prime it. We need the private sector to be fully engaged to take it forward. Uh, this is one billion pound investment. As a matter of fact, we can now say it's going up to 1.1 billion pounds because we've got extra private sector money coming in. It's a 1.1 billion pound investment over the next 10 years into establishing a new energy technologies institute in the UK. You can see the companies that have come on board, uh, oil companies, uh, electricity utilities, and engineering companies. Um, what you can also see is we've got a French utility, we've got the German utility, we've got an American company, Caterpillar, so the Chancellor, as then, the Prime Minister now, has never been saying this only has to be British companies. We're very happy for any company to come on board with us here in the UK. This is going to be established on probably about five different sites in the UK. Uh, and that will all take place uh, starting next year. We've just announced the appointment of, uh, of a director. Um, and that is now uh, therefore moving ahead. And just to finish on what I hope is a positive note. Uh, if you ask the question, how much sunlight arriving on the planet, so I'm back to Fourier's uh, analysis of the temperature of the planet, how much sunlight on the, arriving on the planet would we have to farm in order to create all of the energy requirements of the human population? And the answer is the sunlight arriving in the six relatively small boxes shown on this board. Uh, so if we could convert all of the the sunlight arriving in those little boxes to usable energy, 
we will have solved the problem. <laughs> I, I think what that's really saying is we have been misdirecting our attention away from solar energy conversion. There are a couple of good projects going on in the world. There's one in Spain using very simple technology, vast mirrors that are moving to pick up the optimal energy from the sun through the day. We need to see considerably more effort in trying to farm solar energy as we move forward in time. So I think the problem is doable technologically. I come back to where I started. The question is whether we can get the political will internationally and the agreement that everyone can feel is the right way forward uh, within that political system. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Sir David. That was very interesting indeed. And I think you do an excellent job bridging science and politics. Um, just going back to one of your earlier slides, you're talking about you get carbon emissions and you put in CO2 emissions being about 11 tons per person. And you're also suggesting we need to get that down to about two and a half tons to be fair and to actually solve the problem globally. Now, my math suggests that's about 80%. And the UK government's talking about a 6% cut in emissions. And the politics are that in two months' time, we're going to have a climate change bill that addresses those 60% cuts in emissions and that's ignoring aviation and shipping. And so I guess I'd like to ask, um, what is your advice to government about a climate change bill that doesn't really match the science or what the problem needs to solve it? Well, as, as one of the architects of the climate change bill, uh, let, let me just say why I think you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the British government was the first government to establish a, a target for reducing carbon dioxide emissions and has now been joined by the German government and I think by the French government. But we still to see some action from the French government. <laughs> The European Union is on a road with cap and trade that at least tests out a process. Aside from that, we haven't got action in the rest of the world. Now my point quite simply is, once the rest of the world starts taking action, and I did say this during my talk, we will start moving on to a different trajectory. Right, so I think your figure of 80%, I would agree with you, but I'm simply saying, for Britain to say, we are going to reduce our emissions by 80% without watching what the international community is doing, is not on. I mean, basically, we, we made that announcement of 60% in 2003 before the extra meeting, and when everyone thought that 550 parts per million was a good figure to go for. We haven't changed that, basically, because we're still in this leadership role in the international negotiations. And I have spent the last five years traveling around the world, the last week in South Africa, trying to persuade other governments to announce trajectories that we, they can bring into the international negotiations. So far, without any success. So I, I don't think there's any shortage of leadership from the British government, which was our intention. We were trying to break the deadlock in negotiations by making that announcement. And so far, we haven't succeeded. You're shaking your head. We've taken the United States with us in the Heiligen Dam Agreement, which essentially says, if you read it, all of those signatories agree to what we're trying to do, but it doesn't actually establish a mechanism. While, while I'm answering this question to you, may I just say, any international agreement has to have, first of all, a global target, and we're all agreeing on anything between 450 and 550 as close to 450 as possible, is what the British government is saying. <coughs> Secondly, nation by nation, a trajectory that achieves that objective by the end of the century. Thirdly, we have to have a fiscal process that drives it through. It's no good having 
the idea that you will punish a country if it doesn't uh, match up to this, but moreover, by creating a carbon dioxide commodity, you engage the market. So it, it's, and we know this works. And then fourthly, we must have a, an agreement which deals with the developing world, both in terms of adapting to the impacts of climate change that are coming, <coughs> and also transfers technologies so they can leapfrog into the low carbon technologies that we're developing. Those four elements are de minimis as far as I'm concerned, and that's what I've been going around talking about the countries about. I have never found in those negotiations that they come back to me and say, when the British government announces it's going to reduce by 80%, we'll talk to you. That's not the issue. We have already put ourselves in that leadership position. Final point I make, and quite simply, because you're asking a very good question, is Britain cannot solve this problem on its own. We need internationally to reduce emissions by 80%. One more question. I think we're very close to lunch. Jeff on the red flag. Thank you, Sir David. Uh, many congratulations for all the work you do and so on. Uh, I'm very hesitant to make this slight, slight criticism of the climate change. <laughs> 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 but what I very much liked was your wedge diagram. And human nature being what it is, in a sense it's important to try and keep on a trajectory. Otherwise we'll leave it till tomorrow, we'll leave it to the next generation. And my slight criticism of our own climate change bill, I'm being very broken now talking in the UK, is that there are not, there's not even an aspirational annual target. And I think a lot of people will feel happier, not necessarily a, a, a target which you either fail or succeed, but at least an aspirational target. Because otherwise, you'll wait for five years and say, oh my goodness, we've not done very well over the last five years, we're really now going to have to pull our socks off. So an aspirational target in the climate change bill, I think, would be a big issue. Thank you. All right, so I didn't really mention the climate change bill. In essence, the climate change bill is saying, if we just introduce regulation and carbon dioxide pricing and climate change levy, we still don't necessarily achieve what we want to achieve. We also need political consensus so that all of the energy related companies know that there is a long term projection so they can make the investments they need. So the climate change bill establishes a new climate change committee and the nearest analogy that, to that committee is the Bank of England. So the committee has a remit which is Every five years, this is the amount of carbon dioxide Parliament expects you to have reduced our emissions by so as to be on that linear trajectory. And the discussion in Parliament was around whether or not it should be an annual objective or whether it should be every five years. Some Parliaments, I mean, some governments don't even last five years. <laughs> now, of course, it's a very good point, but the counter to that is that it's somewhat impractical to do it on an annual basis. What if you have a freezing cold winter and there's a big demand for extra energy one year and the next year happens to be very warm and the next year balances it out again. Um, so what, what to, but I, I think implicit in the climate change bill is the expectation that we're on a linear drop. So I don't hear you saying that the remit is to reduce it by an annual amount that it should be an aspiration. Now, that is the aspiration. If you read the bill, it's saying, actually, we should be on a linear downward trajectory. That climate change committee, fascinating, it's going to pull regulatory levers and be watching to see, just as the Bank of England tries to keep our inflation within certain limits, it's going to be watching the carbon dioxide reduction is kept in certain limits. I think it's a, a good way forward. Yeah, not convinced, but I go with it. <laughs>